Have you ever wondered if the little orphan Annie was real? And if so, where did the author who wrote about her live? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. In 1849, James Whitcomb Riley was born into an affluent Indiana family. He grew up in a large house, fully embracing the newly emerging Midwestern lifestyle by spending his days running around barefoot and finding creeks and ponds to swim in. While at home, his mother would tell James, his sisters, and reportedly, a little orphan named Annie, stories about goblins and monsters who would snatch them up if they misbehaved. While these stories might have spurred his interest in poetry, schooling was never a priority for him. By the time he had graduated from the 8th grade, he was already 20 years old and knew nearly nothing of math nor grammar. Nonetheless, he continued his pursuit of poetry, choosing to write in the same way he spoke. And while his career was not an instant success, after years of working odd jobs, he finally applied for a position at the Indianapolis Journal, where he was able to write editorials and publish some of his poems. It was not long before critics slammed him for ignoring proper punctuation and grammatical rules, but the locals loved reading his poetry. He connected with the average person in a way that no other authors of the time were. His work was full of dialect and in proper English, parroting the way Midwesterners spoke. He wanted to expand his reach and began submitting his poems to larger, national publications, but he was constantly rejected. Starting in 1880, he began a circuit of reading tours where he would travel around the Midwest reading his poetry, and when he arrived in Chicago, he drew the largest crowd the city had ever seen for a public reading event. For the first time in his life, he was now able to earn a reliable income from his poetry alone. He continued going on tour, giving lectures at universities, writing a few books, and perhaps, most popularly, Little Orphant Annie, allegedly based on the orphan girl he had grown up with. By the late 1800s, he had written and published over 1,000 poems, and his royalties began to stack up, making him one of, if not the most financially successful poet of his day. Before announcing his retirement, he purchased his childhood home and gifted it to his sisters. Instead of purchasing a house for himself, he decided to rent a bedroom in the house of his dear friends. He had never married, nor had any children of his own, so it was nice for him to have the company of friends in his retired years. The all-brick, Italianate residence in Indianapolis had been built in 1872. Though it had been updated several times over the years, it maintained an elegant, dare say extravagant interior for a home of its size. The parlor, with its extra high ceilings, was elaborately hand-stenciled with artisan plaster work coffering the ceilings. In the center of the room, a large crystal chandelier, which originally ran on gas, had been updated to run on electric. The library, with its half-height bookcases, provided a comfortable space for James to read and write poetry. In the dining room, with its elaborate wainscoting and built-in hutch, provided a perfectly elegant space for entertaining dinner parties with his guest. Upstairs, his friend's bedroom was furnished in traditional Victorian-era fashion, with a wash basin and a boudoir. While his own bedroom was considerably more modern, with a dark stone fireplace and a functioning sink in a time when indoor plumbing was still considerably rare. In fact, the house collected rainwater, which was stored in the attic and then dispersed throughout the house to allow for functioning toilets and even a full bathroom. James lived in the house for 23 years, and after both he and his friends passed away, it was put on the market for sale with its furnishings included. In 1916, William Fortune, a football player for the Michigan Wolverines, purchased the house and lived in it as is. Just five years later, before he joined the Chicago Cardinals to go pro, he conveyed the house to the James Whitcomb Riley Memorial Association. Today, the house remains with much of its original interior, save the kitchen, and is open to the public for tours as the James Whitcomb Riley Museum home. Did you have a favorite room? Or maybe you have a favorite poem from this author. Either way, let me know down below in the comment section. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.